uh, a very uh, warm welcome to you, Ambassador uh, Tanvi Sahib, to IDSA. Uh, as you all know, today IDSA has uh, launched a book uh, written by Ambassador Tanvi Sahib, who is a prolific writer and has already written two books. And this is the third of the series, uh, titled "The Islamic Challenge in West Asia: Doctrinal and Political uh, Competition After the Arab Spring." Uh, sir, may I request you to give it short, little summary about your book and why and how you were initiated into this? Uh, yes. The book is a result of the developments that are taking place across West Asia and North Africa after the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring is now two and a half years old, and it has very, very complex political scenario has emerged. Uh, it is a scenario of confrontation, competition, and conflict. And I wanted to study various Islamic groups that are part of this competition. So I have looked. Uh, therefore, I have given a subtitle to the book. It is the you know, doctrinal and political competitions after the Arab Spring. There are three main role players. There is the Muslim Brotherhood, centered at Egypt, but also has affiliates in different parts of the Arab world. Uh, you have the Saudi Wahhabia doctrinal system, and you have the radical doctrinal system of Al Qaeda. These are in competition with each other. They are seeking to occupy physical space. They are also looking to influence the political order across the region, and this is the main theme. Uh, this has got doctrinal implications, it has religio-political implications, it has diplomatic and military implications as well. All of these are looked at uh, through the various chapters of the book. Sir, may I ask you, uh, what in your view is the future of political Islam uh, as you uh, already... See, political history. Islam or Islamism is a doctrine is an ideology that developed in the 20th century principally in the Arab world as a, as a response to imperialism. The Arab world was now subjugated by western arms. It was a total occupation. It was a military, political, cultural an economic occupation of the entire territory of Islam. Obviously, there was a first reaction was secular in the sense that a generation emerged that effectively sought to reject its past and its own heritage and to build up a society primarily on Western lines. But this was not authentic and did not have much resonance among the masses. It was an elitist response. People recognized that if there has to be a successful response to British and uh, other imperialisms in the region, it had to be founded on something that was their own, that emerged from their own heritage and culture. Therefore, salvation of the Arab people had to come from within Islam. Islam meant Sharia. But Sharia is not a document, it is founded on a number of principles, it has a considerable flexibility, considerable variety and therefore it is something that you can go back to and draw those principles that would be relevant. As far as the future is concerned, I believe that the setback pertaining to the Morsi regime is a blip. It is part of a larger political process which will take many years. But the days of tyranny, the days of military rule are over. And you will have to have a political order that is responsive to the aspirations of the people and that enshrines in its constitution active political participation in the political process. Uh, so, uh as you as you know that the things which are unfolding in West Asia, uh, you know, are of a serious, uh, you know, challenge as it is seen by the not only the regional players, the extra regional players, 
and the larger international community. Uh, if we if we look at the situation in Syria or what is unfolding in Egypt, uh, do you think uh, there would be an easy solutions, uh, you know, for for such a you know, such a you such a serious challenge? Mm -hmm. Where a mass of people are transforming themselves by changing by challenging the earlier political order and seeking a new political order in which they can participate actively. It is a very painful process. It is also a long drawn out process. You have the powerful forces of status quo. The forces of status quo do not give up power, do not give up their position. Ranged against them are a variety of opposition figures who are from the extreme right to the extreme left. Very frequently they do not coordinate with each other. Even if you have one grouping within them, who are more popular or more effective because of grassroots support, it does not mean that they have with them the political balance, the political theory, the political experience in order to become role players in the new order. They also flounder because they have no experience of governance. If you have no experience of governance, you are bound to make mistakes. In the case of Egypt, you have the Muslim Brotherhood that came to power at a time when it was entirely ill-prepared for power. You had it was headed by extremely rigid, narrow-minded, doctrinaire individuals who were not able to understand what had happened, this implications of this extraordinary development in their country. They went by their old ways. But there is a new generation of members in the Muslim Brotherhood who are extremely modern, who are familiar with Western writings, who are some, who are familiar with modern technologies, and who are wedded to popular participation. So I am convinced that ultimately, as Olivier Roy has said, Islam and democracy, they actually support each other. Democracy in the Arab world needs Islamist participation, and Islamists can come to power only through democracy. So I think that this is the prospect. In the short term, you will have serious problems because there are a number of entities within the Arab world who are opposed to change and that is very natural, particularly countries of the GCC. They are challenged not only by what they see as Iranian hegemony, they are also challenged by the political power of the Muslim Brotherhood. So though they come from within the same Sunni background, Salafi Sunni background, they still face a political challenge. So the forces of status quo will invariably support, uh, will try to maintain the existing order by going back to the tyrannies of the old regime, which is what is happening. Is this sustainable? According to me, it is not sustainable. The Arab people are truly awakened. The Arab order, the order in West Asia, North Africa is a result of imperialism. It has survived for 80 years as a result of very close collaboration between Western imperialists and a large number of local rulers. That is going to change. May I ask you, sir, one more question? Uh, this is since your book uh, talks about the Islamist challenge. Uh, what are your views on on Islam? You know, there is uh, there is this discourse that Islam is a static religion and not flexible. Would you uh, like to comment on yeah, this? This is a mistaken impression uh, and I have addressed it frontally in my book in both uh, chapters 1, the first chapter and the last chapter. I have pointed out as a result of my research that Islam as a religion as experienced in a political order was extraordinarily flexible. Firstly, the tenets of Islam themselves have been subjected to constant review. You had the instrument of ishtihad. Ishtihad means logical reasoning. That means that you apply the principles of Islam in specific circumstances on the basis of reason. And two other instruments that were available to you at that time was qayaf and uh, that, uh, that was analogy 
uh, and you had various other instruments that were, uh, you know, you had the instrument of Ijma, which is uh, uh, which is consensus, and Qayas, which is uh, which means analogy. On the basis of this, these two instruments, you were able to ensure that Islamic precepts were constantly updated and made relevant to contemporary times. Then you had various other doctrines that were inherent in Islamic theory and practice right from the beginning. You had a distinction made by scholars between Ibadat, that is those tenets that are applicable to the relationship between man and God, which are immutable, and those which deal with day-to-day -day affairs, they are called Muamalat, which deal with man's relationship with the other men. They had tremendous flexibility. The, the scholarship that had emerged was a scholarship which had the authority of issuing fatwas. Fatwa means, uh, it means various interpretations of the texts to apply them into specific situations. And the people who wrote these fatwas were not rigid and doctrinaire people. They had a lot of flair. They were very deeply concerned with the contemporary scenario. No attempt has ever been made in Islam to replicate a society or a culture or a state that is seven, uh, that, that belongs to the 8th or 7th uh, or 8th centuries. That is completely a misreading. In the 20th century, when you come to Islam, you find that Islam is a subjugated by imperialism. And in the sec after the Second World War, you find the emergence of tyrannies in the shape of traditional monarchies as well as military dictatorships. In both instances, you find that Islamic forces are in opposition. And in opposition, very often a radical element used to come forward because of the violence perpetrated upon them by the tyrannies. So as a result, you do have a situations where the radical element had come had become more, more important and more significant. But now that there is an end to tyrannies, this is a golden opportunity for Islamic discourse to recover some of the earlier flexibilities on the basis of well-established principles on the one hand and to and to be sensitive to all the other developments that have taken place which uh, you know these are in the realm of politics in the realm of economics in the real realm of technology and finance all of these are going to be influential factors in determining a new discourse that will emerge over the next few decades thank you, thank you very much sir thank you.